go live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Explore Classroom. This is another one of our Space Week editions. My name is Jordan Lim, and I work on the education team here at National Geographic in Washington, D.C. Today we have Jeffrey Marlowe joining us today, and he does some amazing work around the world. Um, and from all of us at Nat Geo, I want to say thank you, Jeff, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate hearing you talk about your work, and um, I'm going to give the class a little bit intro about what you do so they know what we're going to talk about today. Um, Jeffrey Marlowe is a geobiologist postdoctoral scholar at Harvard University where he studies methane metabolism and microbial communities in extreme environments. Learning more about extremophiles. Learn more about extremophiles in the deep sea helps scientists develop strategic ways of searching for life beyond Earth. Jeff is also a science writer and the executive director of the Ad Astra Academy, a nonprofit educational program that brings the excitement of explorations to communities around the world. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And for those of you watching on YouTube Live, please feel free to leave your questions in the sidebar. We're going to do 15 minutes of Jeffrey going to talk about his work, and then we're going to do 25 minutes of Q&A. And the order will be Ms. DeWerf's class first then Miss Fairweather, then Miss Citizen, and then Miss Fletcher. That's the order that we're going to go into the Q&A, so be ready. Um, and that will be the order that we'll do it. And um, Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. And it's really a pleasure to get a chance to talk to everyone today. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about the kind of work that I've been doing um, and how it kind of relates to space. So. It might seem a little bit weird that we're, we're here in Space Week and you came to learn about how we're um, kind of exploring huge planetary bodies and moons outside of the Earth uh, throughout the solar system and throughout the universe. But I'm actually going to be talking about the smallest things that we find on the Earth. So how do those connect and why is that a logical transition to be making? Hopefully I'm going to be able to convince you that it all makes sense and that our way of studying the really, really tiny microorganisms on Earth uh, is a really interesting way to think about the possibility of life beyond Earth. So I'm going to run you through a little bit about how I got here um, and take you on a quick tour of three locations uh, that I've studied and how these specific spots help us to think about life beyond Earth. Uh, with that, I will try to share my screen and start up a little uh, presentation. All right, everyone's <laughs> there, good. Um, so I grew up in uh, Colorado, around the mountains, um, and my family would often go on short trips you know, around the area, and one of those locations was Yellowstone National Park. So this is a, a hot spring at Yellowstone. And these amazing sort of this rainbow of colors comes from microorganisms that can actually survive inside the hot springs. So these are temperatures that are way hotter than anything a human could ever survive. And yet, there are microbes, tiny little organisms that can survive inside the hot springs. This was really amazing to me, the idea that there are so many diverse organisms on our planet that they can inhabit really different areas. Um, and it made me wonder, you know, what the limits of that are. If they can exist in these really hot springs, uh, maybe they can exist in really cold places like Mars or really hot planets like Venus. You know, what are the limits of what life can deal with? That was one really important experience. The other was going to Florida and seeing a space shuttle launch. Um, I went when I was in about uh, sixth grade, I think, so probably the age of some of you guys today. And it was just amazing to watch this crazy rocket ship shoot up into the sky and then disappear into space. The fact that it felt so nearby that, you know, within two minutes you could watch something go from where we are on the Earth to a whole different area in space. And it was about the same time that we were starting to send rovers to Mars, like the Pathfinder rover uh, in 1997. The rovers that are currently driving around Mars are much more sophisticated and much, much more uh, scientifically capable than this little guy, but this kind of started the process for me. Uh, this is a little shoebox-sized rover that was driving around and sniffing rocks um, and really presenting Mars as a physical place 
much like any real place we go to on Earth, where you're walking around, touching, feeling rocks, um, and trying to make sense of, of what they can tell us. And this kind of led me to the study of life um, potentially beyond Earth. So that's astrobiology, combining space um, and biology. It's the study of the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. This is a really big question, you know, are we alone in the universe? Is there life beyond Earth? What would it look like? What would it tell us about our experience on Earth? These are some of the questions that people have been asking for millennia. And we're, you know, here on this Earth at a really exciting time where we might be able to actually come up with answers to these questions. So I'm going to point out a few areas where I've tried to track down um, ways of addressing this question. Looking at limits of life on Earth, some of the most extreme life forms on our planet, and how that might tell us something about whether or not life could actually exist in space somewhere. So the first spot is the Rio Tinto here in Spain, southwestern Spain. And it's this crazy river that looks like this. The water is red. Um, and this comes from actually a naturally occurring microbial process where microbes are turning, uh, are consuming, essentially breathing iron. In the same way that, um, you know, we respire oxygen, that we need oxygen to li live, these microbes need iron. And they transform it into a form of iron that makes this red color. This also happens at a pH of about two. So that's really, really, really acidic. And, um, you know, for many other life forms like us, that would be really, really dangerous. But for these microbes, it's actually required. So the same sorts of minerals that are forming here at the Rio Tinto in Spain, pairing minerals with bits of water in their mineral structure as well, these same minerals have been found on Mars by some of those Mars rivers. So the fact that we know that these minerals exist, can we actually connect that process to microbiology? So by studying the microbes here at the Rio Tinto in Spain, we're trying to figure that out. The next spot uh, is a place called the Marum Crater in Vanuatu. So this is in the South Pacific. You can see Australia there on the left side of this map. And this is an active volcano um, where there is a lava lake at the bottom of this huge crater that's kind of glowing red. And this is a place where new rock is being formed. That's what volcanism is. It's generating new parts of the Earth's crust. And we could see, um, using drones and other fun techniques, um, that rock was being splattered around inside the crater. And we were able to go down into the crater to see what this looked like. So here's a short video uh, that I'm going to kind of narrate that shows what we were up to. This is the crater itself. And you look down, and there's just this huge um, boiling pit of lava that's about a football field across. So this is a really big crater to get down inside it with all of our sampling equipment uh, and get really close to the, the edge. So uh, do not recommend doing this uh, <laughs> for too long. And you want to be very careful about what you're, what you're doing and the safety precautions you're taking. But we were able to pick up just formed. So right now we're looking around for little chunks that had just popped up from that crater. And we saw samples that were about 30 seconds old. So we had seen it pop up, land on that surface right in front of us, and we ran in and picked it up before um, it had managed to cool all the way down to, to kind of ambient temperatures. The question here was how long it takes for microbes to colonize some of these rocks. Every single surface that you come into contact with today and throughout your life, most likely, uh, has microbes on it. The air that we're breathing right now has about 1,000 microbes uh, per breath. Um, the water that you drink has microbes in it. Our, our guts um, have tons of microbes in them. The human body itself is dominantly made of microorganisms. So the point, microbes exist everywhere. They permeate our planet. And we were trying to figure out if there was a spot on Earth where there are no microbes. Rocks that had just formed out of a volcano, that's a pretty good chance that there are no microorganisms around. We were trying to figure out exactly how long it takes rock. This tells us something about life beyond Earth, because 
again, it sets the limits. How old a piece of rock needs to be to, for a microbe to potentially inhabit it, um, and what kind of the limits of that habitability are. Two sites. The last one I'm going to show you um, is in the ocean, and that's where I do most of my work, is looking in the deep sea um, at spots called methane seeps. Uh, there are five kind of around the, the United States that I've looked at, um, pointed out here. And we use instruments like this robot, a remotely operated vehicle. This can go down uh, thousands of meters below the seafloor. Or small submersibles, like the Alvin here, um, which looks like this inside, where you kind of peer out through these small portholes as you go down uh, hundreds or thousands of meters below the sea surface. And we find these really weird alien landscapes down there, where there are these white bits of microbial mats, these orange patches, different types of microbes, these rock chimney things that form, um, and these bizarre shapes that we don't really know how to explain yet. And these seeps um, are really important from a sort of climate change perspective because there's methane coming out of them. Methane is a strong greenhouse gas um, that if it gets into can cause a lot of warming. But down here on the sea floor, we're looking at how microbes in the sediments just below the surface here can actually eat methane. Crazy way of getting um, energy to live, just like we saw with the red water. Those microbes were breathing iron. Consuming methane. So there are all different types of metabolism um, environments. Um, we're trying to figure out how these metabolisms work and if they could also be relevant for other locations um, beyond Earth. Those are a few of my favorite sites. Um, they relate to space because you know we're exploring these other planets and we're getting a pretty good idea of what their environments used to be like. This is a cool selfie that the uh, Mars Science Laboratory mission, Curiosity, took a couple of years ago. Um, it's been sniffing around the planet to see what conditions used to be like billions of years ago. It's seen that there was, and there still is, a little bit of methane around Mars. Those minerals that form um, are mostly made of, or largely made of iron, and could have been involved with microbial metabolisms to form that iron. So we're kind of coming at this from two perspectives. One is in space, looking at places like Mars to see what the conditions were like. The other is here on Earth, building up what microbes and life forms, how they create environments. And hopefully these two ways of studying astrobiology will meet in the middle somewhere. So Mars is obviously one important location. Enceladus, this is a moon of Saturn where there's liquid water plumes being shot off from the surface. Europa has a liquid water uh, ocean underneath an ice cap. And Titan has lakes of liquid methane and ethane. So these are kind of the top priority locations that we're going to be searching for life and applying these kinds of studies here on Earth um, that I've been showing you uh, to try to look at how extreme forms of life on Earth could tell us something about how life exists beyond Earth. So with that, I'm uh, happy to, to stop for now and see if you guys have any questions. Um, and let me know what you think. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for sharing. I really appreciate that you covered a lot of topics and you did connect it back to Space Week. And it's really sweet that you, you know, covered a lot of different ecosystems, geologies, oceanography, all that's super important for us to understand climate change and exploration as a whole. So yes, I do appreciate that holistic, well-rounded approach. Of course. Jump to, since um, Ms. DeWerf's class is not available right now, they're still coming back for lunch, we're actually going to start with um, Miss Fairweather's class, which is calling from Arbutus Global Middle School in Victoria, Canada. Um, I'm going to unmute your mic now and feel free to ask a question. Come to the front of the room and ask a question. Does anyone have a question? Oh, here we go. Oh, 
We want to know what what the strangest thing that you've ever done in your job is. <laughs> oh man, the strangest thing I've ever done. Um, hmm. I think it's probably hard to beat um, descending into that a couple of years ago. This is a place that could kill you in every possible way, exploding lava all around you. Um, the air itself has poisonous gases, so you have to wear a respirator the whole time. And we were down there for about 30 minutes. You got to get in there fast, get out as quick as possible. Um, so that's something that I would not want to repeat every single day, but once in a while to get some really interesting samples, uh, it was probably worth it. Nice. And one more question from the class from Victoria, Canada. I think you're going to have to be a little bit louder. We didn't catch you. Can you maybe come closer to the mic or speak a little louder, please? What is the most boring microorganism you've ever studied, and where did you find it? The most Jeffrey, boring did you microbe? catch that? Is that what I heard? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it was the most boring microbe. Can you give me a thumbs up if that was the right question? No? No. Yes, yes it was. Uh, well, to start with, I'm slightly offended that you could think any microorganism could be boring. Uh, but I will entertain your question nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> I think that, um, OK, well, here's another way to look at it. Boring maybe means that we know it the best. For that, I would say E. coli. Uh, if you've heard of E. coli, that is the an organism that lives inside our guts, uh, and it's really important for kind of breaking down our food. It can also be dangerous if you get the wrong type of it. Um, but we know what a lot of its genes do. About 50% of its DNA we can link to a specific enzyme or process, and that's really useful for knowing how microorganisms work. But it also means that it doesn't have a lot of surprises for us to, to discover in the future. It's a good way to think about developing new capabilities and tweaking metabolism to make biofuels or something else. Um, but from a discovery perspective, I'd say there's a little bit less uh, new ground with the E. coli. Great. That's a great answer. And sorry if we, we might have misread that question just a little bit. The mic was acting kind of funny, but hopefully still the answer was still helpful. And it was a great question, regardless. Um, we're going to move to our next class. Um, Miss Citizens class from Highland Oaks Elementary, grade five. I'm going to turn on your mic now. Please send two people to ask questions. All right, so, Tyson, I saw your hand first, and then the young lady behind her. What would you find in the sea, in the deep sea? What would we find? Um, that's a very good question. We find a lot of things. Luckily, I have two uh, show and tell objects for you. So we go down there, and you saw that one video. We have a rover that's driving around. Um, it has robotic arms that can scoop up rocks and sediments. Um, and one thing we do is take plugs of that sediment. So we have a plastic tube that pushes down into the seafloor and collects mud. Um, and that looks something like this. So you can see that this is a core of sediment. Uh, I could try to bring this closer. You can see different layers of microbes and um, minerals. So here you can see a really iron-rich layer that's red formed. Then we have kind of a dark gray layer that tells you something else about the microbiology. And here's sort of a lighter brown layer. So this is a chunk of the seafloor that we've brought up uh, Pacific Ocean. And we can study tiny little organisms inside here at different depths uh, that tell us really cool things about what's happening. We pick up our rocks. And this is what some of the rocks look like. We break them up into smaller pieces and put them in bottles like this. Um, and these are you know, similar to something you'd, you might find on the surface. These don't look all that different. But the microbes inside 
here are totally different, never really accept. So we pick up these chunks of the seafloor, the sediments or the rocks. Um, they maybe don't look too crazy different, but when we study the tiny organisms inside, we find whole new forms of life that we never knew existed. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Fantastic. And let's get one more question from that Highland Oaks class again. Please come to the mic. Um, in the, uh, the Red Lake in Spain, has anyone ever, like a human, ever touched it with a bare hand? And has there been any effect? <laughs> uh, it's a good question, yes. <laughs> um, I might have been one of those humans. And it's not great. But if you just do it for you know, a couple seconds, it's not the end of the world. But you do want to wear protective equipment when like, wading into the water. If you walk in there, you want to be careful. But it's not going really, to uh, melt your hand off or anything. In Vanuatu, that's much more dangerous. So don't ever touch any part of that. Uh, but the, the Rio Tinto is OK for a few seconds. Gotcha. Great. And then we're going to switch to Ms. DeWerf's class. Um, thank you for joining us. Coming back from lunch, I think it's where you were. Mike, now, and please send some students to the front of the class. I don't know if they have a lot of questions. They kind of came in towards the end. Um, but I have a question, if that's OK. Sure, go for it. All right, so here's my question. Um, the life that you found in the bottom of the ocean in those um, those little samples, core samples or ocean samples, um, what's the, is the DNA in those life forms similar to what is on the surface life forms? Do they still have the same nitrogen bases, or do they have things that are different? Yeah, that's a good question. So the the microbes we find in the same structure of DI. Uh, it's still the same A, T, C, and G, the same bases that make up our own DNA. Uh, uh, but the genes are quite different. And they're related to some things you might find here on the surface. The biggest difference, though, is that they is poisonous. So if we sort of think about our the top bit, this bit that's red, there's oxygen there. Because iron oxide is what makes this red color. That's like rust. Um, so there's oxygen here. But once you get below about three or five centimeters, all the oxygen goes away. So that's, it's only below that area that the microbes that eat methane exist. And they're that are produced by their genes um, are totally different. They're eating methane in a really weird way, and they form a symbiosis with other microbes that we don't really know how that works. The DNA, again, is the same. It makes what it encodes that is really different and surprising. Great. And do we have a question? Did that question from the teacher um, inspire any questions from the students in your class? Do you have any questions? I don't think so. We're just we're good. All right. No worries. All good. Um, we can go back and do one more quick lap around the classes. So I'm going to head back to Victoria, Canada, if you guys have another question. Anyone? Me. Go for it. If you could go to any planet or moon in the solar system, which one would you choose, and what would you do there, assuming you had a magic spacesuit? Did you catch that, Jeffrey? I uh, did not. It looked very funny based on everyone's reaction, but I did not hear it. <laughs> it was definitely funny. It was, let me see if I can summarize. It was, um, if you would travel to any place in space, planet, or object flying in space, where would you go? And then something about a magic spacesuit. I didn't catch it, but I don't know. Interpret as you will. OK. <laughs> um, um, I would be most interested in going to Europa. Um, I think that's right at the of no. And it also has a lot of potential for target. So we know a fair amount about Mars. And we 
have a sense that in the ancient past, it might have had some very interesting sites. But Europa, we know that there's liquid water, but we don't really know anything beyond that. So if we can go to that ice cap um, and see what's in the water itself, that would be awesome, especially at the base of that ocean. We might see things, you know, like these rocks and sediments that we have here. Uh, that would be cool. So I want to go there with whatever magical space suit. Great. Awesome. And then we're going to go back to Miss Citizens class in Highland Oaks Elementary. I'm going to unmute your mic right now. <laughs> um do you think that it would um that humans could possibly live on mars <laughs> um could humans live on mars well we need a lot of protection from the elements there so it's really really cold spacesuit or habitat oxygen to breathe so we would need or make it there like the soil on mars a lot of nutrients though so we could potentially grow crops that would be, um ah, the other problem is there's a lot of so we would need some houses uh to shield that a lot of people think that the like caves on mars might actually be the best locations because you're protected from the radiation and you can kind of build um, big by these potential caves. So it's certainly possible to build some kind of colony, but you, we would need a lot of technology and a lot of planning uh, to make it Great. worthwhile. Uh, that is a fantastic answer, and we are out of time, but I think that is a good place to stop. You know, moving to Mars, so hopeful and optimistic. I think that's a great <laughs> that's right. to end for today. Um, Thank you to all the classes that have joined. Thank you, Jeff, for joining. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube Live, we also appreciate that you uh, spent some time today to talk with us. Um, this is part of National Geographic's Space Week version of Explorer Classrooms. You can tell I'm wearing my Supernova shirt right now. So for those of you who want to join a talk maybe on Thursday and Friday, um, you can go to natgeoed.org and search for Explorer Classroom, and the schedule will be there. Um, feel free to wear any fun space costumes that you might have to that next talk. And those are on Thursday, 1.30 p.m. this week, Eastern Time, and November 17th, which is Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. There's two more space talks. And thanks again for everyone who joined. I'm going to turn on the mics, and why don't we give a big thank you and goodbye to Jeff. Turning on the mics now. Bye. <laughs> All right.